did this come about, that uh, this Edith Stein thing for me? Uh, well, after I retired, I returned to college. I'm a student at heart, and I earned a master's from LaSalle in theology and ministry, and that's where my interest in Edith Stein began. Uh, my first class in that program was on classic Christian spirituality, and I chose to do my paper on Edith Stein. I didn't know much about Edith Stein, but somehow she intrigued me, and if you've ever had to do a, a paper in college, you know it's a really a great way to, you're kind of forced to dig in. It's a great way to know your subject. And I kind of thought I would do that, satisfy my curiosity, and move on. Well, it didn't, didn't turn out that way. It piqued my curiosity. Uh, and one of the requirements for a master's is you have to do a, uh, they call it a master's project. They don't call it a thesis, but basically it's a 50-page paper. And I did that uh, paper on Edith Stein and her, one of her last, I guess her last major uh, work, which is the science of the cross. So I did my 50-page paper on that. Uh, and, I, and then when I left that, I developed this talk, and I've given this talk in several places. Um, so somehow she's, Edith Stein has got a hold of me. You know, it's one of those strange things. Um, so she's a, she's a modern day saint uh, whose spiritual journey to sainthood uh, started within Judaism. She was really a, originally a Jew, and she was a, uh, canonized on October 11th, uh, October 11th, 1998, by Saint Pope John Paul II. I think uh, she has a very compelling life story and a spirituality that she herself simply describes as living at the hand of God. I think a spirituality that is practical in its simplicity. Uh, what I want to do this morning uh, is or, I want to do two things. First, I want to give you an introduction to, to her life uh, that I'll present in the context of two major phases of her life, beginning with her Jewish roots, then her time as an atheist, a philosopher, a Catholic convert, a teacher, a Carmelite nun, martyr and a declared saint. And her life I want to present in the two parts of her life. The first part of her life is from her birth to the completion of her formal college education at age 24. And at this point, this becomes a transition point in her spiritual life. Now she's still an atheist because of her, but because of her philosophical studies and what she did was, what she studied was phenomenology. Anybody know phenomenology ever heard of those? I'm going to give you a brief time on it. It won't be too much. Because it's important to understand her spiritual conversion. But And because of her philosophical study, she's actually become open to the reality of God. And her profession was as a philosopher. So it's kind of important to know something about her philosophy to see how that could bring her to an acceptance of God. Uh, and then... Uh, so at this point, I'll give a brief uh, introduction to the uh, psycho or the philosophy of phenomenology so you, so you can understand her conversion a little bit. And then I'll pick up with the second half of her life, which will take her to her death at the age of 50 at Auschwitz. And then I'm going to end with, uh, I'm going to say a couple things about her Carmelite spirituality. Again, a spirituality that she captures with the image of living at the hand of God. Now, one good thing about Edith Stein, as you probably noticed when you came in here, a lot of books, uh, is that she was a prolific writer, uh, much, of which has been, much of which has been translated into English from her native uh, German. Um, and a lot of her writing is philosophical because that was her profession, which can be difficult, but she also did spiritual and theological writings. Uh, she did a partial autobiography for the first 25 years of her life. Plus, she was a prolific letter writer. You don't write a prolific email writer these days, right? But she was a prolific letter writer, many of which have been published. And in a sense, that kind of picks up the second half of her life. It's not quite an autobiography, but it gets at her, her person, her personality. Um, plus, people that knew her have written about her, kind of giving an independent perspective on what she was like. And Sister Teresa Renault uh, Posseth, who was Edith's, who was Edith's uh, uh, novice mistress, wrote a biography of Edith Stein in 1947, just five years after her death. 
and many people have written books about her since then. It like, seems like there's more coming out all the time. Uh, now, one of the things that, that may strike you as being odd is that I'm referring to her as Edith Stein or St. Edith Stein by her, and she was a Carmelite nun. But that's how typically she is referred to. She's called by her lay name, uh, and even by her own Carmelite community. And even when uh, John Paul, St. John Paul II canonized her in his homily at her canonization, he referred to her as Edith Stein. So I guess I figured out a good company referring to her that way. Edith Stein was born in Germany on October the 12th, 1891, into Judaism on the day of Yom Kippur, the Jewish Day of Atonement. Now the origin of this day goes all the way back to the time of Moses, and the ritual was a uh, the ritual sacrificial ritual required that two innocent goats be taken from the people. One goat is slain, and his blood is simply sprinkled on the sacred places to purify them. In the Old Testament, proper use of blood is actually a purifying agent. And then the priest lays his hands on the second goat transferring the sins, the guilt, the sins of the people, the people's guilt, onto the second goat, and it's sent into the desert. This is all in the book of Leviticus, chapter 16. In case you want to check it out. And, uh, okay. So now as Christians, we see all this as a foreshadowing of Jesus' atoning for our sin, for our sins, on the cross. And after her conversion to Christianity, Edith Stein would come to see her birth on this day as a foreshadowing of her life and her death. Like a foreshadowing of the cross in her own life. That's trivia. I'd be impressed if anybody knows where this is from. Does anybody recognize that? Has anybody been to Ireland? Oh, okay. Then there's no hope. Been to Ireland? Anybody been to Knock? Yeah. Okay, this is from the this is from the Reconciliation Chapel in Knock. Okay, here's a uh, family photo taken when Edith was maybe two or three here, and she was the youngest of seven children. Okay, in the back row, uh, these names come up again, so I'll, I'll point them out to you. Uh, so in the back row, we have the father Siegfried. Now, an interesting, uh, interesting thing about this photo is that he had actually died a year before this photo was taken. So what they did is they took a passport photo of him and they inserted it into this family portrait. Right? The original Photoshop, right? It does, look, it does look a little, when you look at it, you say, oh, yeah, it does look a little, not quite fitting in there, but that's, uh, that's what they did. Uh, the other sisters are uh, Elsie, Right on the right, she's the oldest sister. Frida is the next oldest on the left. Uh, left. Uh, Arno is the youngest on the right. Yeah. Arno's the youngest on the right, and Paul is the eldest on the left. And there's, that's the back row of the five. And on the on the front row we have Rosa. Okay, Rosa. Uh, also traveled to Auschwitz with uh, Edith Stein, and she was also a martyr there with Edith Stein. Um, and then we have um, Erna, who was the one year older than Edith, and so the closest to her in age, and then we have Edith down here. Oh, and then the mother, uh, like the mother Augusta. So everyone looks so serious, but that's the way they took pictures in those days, right? right. So if Edith, Edith was described as a, quote, a lively, precocious child, an extremely bright child, strong-willed, and prone to temper tantrums. In Edith's own words, she says, during my early years, I was mercurially lively, always in motion, spilling over with pranks, impertinent and precocious, and at the same time intractably stubborn and angry if anything went against my will. 
Now, I right away thought of another Carmelite. Another Carmelite, uh, St. Therese of Lisieux, as a child. Because in the prologue to her journey of the soul, uh, describes her as blonde, blue-eyed, very attractive, precocious, lively, very touchy, capable of violent outbursts of temper tantrums and stubborn. <laughs> so for Edith, for Edith, all this changed around age seven, and she calls it her first great transformation. Like, this is out, out of her autobiography. Uh, in this picture, Edith is uh, eight or nine, and she's the one on the right, right, with her with her, sis yeah, her sister, who was close to her in age, Erna. <coughs> Edith says that at this point, okay, around uh, seven or eight, reason assumed command of me. I recall very well how, from that time on, I was convinced that my mother and my sister had a better knowledge of what was good for me than I had. And because of this confidence, I readily obeyed them. The old stubbornness seemed to disappear, and angry outbursts became all but non-existent. She continues, Early in life I have arrived at such a degree of self-mastery that I could preserve my equanimity almost without a struggle. I do not know how this happened. I do believe that what cured me was the distaste and shame I experienced at the angry outbursts of others and the acute realization I had that the price of such self-indulgence was the loss of one's dignity. I think still very precocious child. <laughs> but quite a realization for someone that young. So Edith as a teenager, uh, she's, uh, Edith in this picture is on the left, she's around 13 or 14. Uh, with her older sister Erna and her nephew by their brother Paul. At the early age of 15, she says, again, her own words, deliberately and consciously, I gave up praying. She seems to have concluded that God did not exist, and if God did not exist, to pray to a non-existent God would be a violation of her conscience. From that point on, she was essentially an atheist until her adult conversion. Now, I'm trying to imagine making such a conscious decision at, at age 15. Um, but what it underscores for me is that even at her early age, it seems that she was very concerned about with how she understood truth and finding truth. So truth mattered, and it had implications in your life. If something's true, it had implications in your life. So for example, in this decision, if she concluded that it was true that God did not exist, it made no sense to pray. Now, we'd say she was wrong in her decision, but I think it reveals a person person of great integrity. Right? That implications, and she followed those implications. And actually, what's ironic, and actually it was this concern for finding the truth that eventually brought her to recognize the reality of God and, and the implications of that in her life. So Edith enrolled in Frederick Wilhelm University in Breslau at the age of 19. She was among the first wave of women to be admitted to the German university. Women had only been allowed admittance since 1908, which was three years earlier. And she studied there for two years. Her areas of interest were German studies, history, and psychology. And psychology was her particular interest. Edith is about 21 in this picture. Uh, Edith is on the right with three of her sisters. Um, but she became, she became disenchanted with psychology. In her words, she says, all my study of psychology had persuaded me that this science was still in its infancy and it still lacked basic concepts. On the other hand, what I learned about phenomenology so far fascinated me tremendously. Edith had become familiar with the writings of Edmund Husserl, the founder of the branch of philosophy called phenomenology. And 
what attracted Edith about phenomenology is that it seemed to have the promise of providing a way of discovering truth. So we have this theme again. So she decided to spend a semester studying phenomenology at the University of Gottingen, where Edmund Hus Husserl was teaching. And as a result of that experience, she became convinced now that the promise of phenomenology, that it, prom that, that it provided a way to discover truth, was real. And she left Frederick Wilhelm University for the University of Gottingen in 1913. She continued her studies in philosophy at the University of Gottingen from 1913 to 1916. And at the age of 24, she passed her doctoral exam, summa cum laude. with highest honors. And uh, you can see, summa cum laude. Um, so this is a copy of the notice that she received from her, uh, from the philosophy department that she had, again, passed summa cum laude. So at this point in, your, in her life, she had completed her formal studies in phenomenology, but she's still an atheist. And at this point, she also entered the transition phase of her life, which actually lasted several years. And during this time, she goes through her period of conversion. And, and it was her search for truth that led her to phenomenology. And at this point, phenomenology then plays an important part in her conversion. She would later say in life, she would later say in life, all who seek truth seek God, whether they know it or not. So now, brief primer on phenomenology, right? With me. Uh, so what is it? So what is it about phenomenology that convinced her that through it she could discover truth? So, if I were to capture the phenomenological approach to finding truth, I would say. I would summarize it in these simple words, trust your instincts. The idea that truth isn't just found through empirical, measurable evidence. We have the ability as human beings to recognize truth instinctively. The phenomenological approach would begin with, first, there is an objective truth. So for example, there is an objective reality out there. So this table exists. But there's also such, such a thing as objective good and evil, objective right and wrong. Second, and in a sense for us humans more importantly, I have the ability to discover this truth. So that we as human beings have a certain ability to recognize truth when we encounter it. Through the senses, sight, hearing, smell, touch, taste, and human logic. But phenomenology would say that you can also intuit the essence or truth of some phenomena. And when we use the term phenomena, phenomena is just anything that you experience. It's a little bit of a fancy word, but it's anything you experience. So it could be a chair, it could be an emotion, it could be some event like 9-11, affected people, it could be another person, it could be yourself, it could be God, right? whatever you experience. Web and Webster defines intuit as the immediate knowing or learning of something without conscious use of reasoning. And if this is true, we'd say you kind of need to pay attention to your first impression. <coughs> so, question, have you ever had a conversation with someone and you experienced a certain wariness and you somehow knew instinctively that this was someone you couldn't trust? Mm -hmm. right? uh, or maybe the opposite. You experienced a certain comfort level on meeting someone and instinctively, intuitively, knew that this, some, this is someone you could trust. Right? Uh, now, having said that, there are also limitations to this way of knowing because we all come to our relationships with certain preconceptions and biases. Uh, maybe you can think of a time when your first impressions were wrong. Right? So you trusted and then you find out later that, wasn't, that didn't work out. Uh, so the third tenet of phenomenology is a method for dealing with these preconceptions that you bring to all your relationships. 
And that is this idea of uh, consciously bracketing or setting aside your preconceptions or internal biases. In other words, let the phenomena that you experience through your senses, in a sense, speak for itself. And it's taking something unfiltered and let the phenomena give you its essence or truth. The idea is that there's a truth out there, you just have to receive it. And the example of, that makes sense in my life is this is the way we're supposed to approach scripture. Right? We're supposed to receive scripture, not bring our biases to scripture, receive it and let God speak to us. One more. So phenomenology says that we have another ability as human beings to help in our search for the truth. And that ability is what Edith Stein called empathy. And she describes it as something like a sixth sense. The Webster definition of empathy is the ability to share in another's emotions, thoughts, or feelings. So empathy is your ability to experience what another person is experiencing. So that the human ability to intuit the truth on your own is helped and augmented by your ability, at least in a secondary way, to experience what another person is experiencing. Example. So this often happens in discussion groups. Like I'm thinking of scripture discussion groups. Um, if, you, if you're in a discussion group and you remain open to what other people are saying, you can often come to insights that you wouldn't have seen on your own. So it kind of underscores the importance of what we call active listening and paying attention to others. It also, to me, underscores the importance of community in that somehow we are all interconnected in our search for the truth. In fact, Edith Stein would say we really can't discover the truth about ourselves, who we are by ourselves. We discover who we are through our interactions with each other. As Christians, we would say we discover truth who, and who we are primarily through our relationship with Jesus. So, phenomenology in a nutshell. Uh, objective truth exists. We can know this objective truth through our senses and through intuition. The importance of bracketing preconceived notions and biases. And, of course, that's easier said than done because a lot of times we don't even know what our biases are. Right? And finally, empathy. That I can experience the truth through another. Um, Edith Stein, in her, in her uh, writing, gives in her writings given gives an I think interesting example of how this way of thinking can lead one to the brink of seeing the reality of God. Let me take you through this. So she says, consider the phenomena of anxiety. And we've all experienced anxiety at one point or other. And generally, when people feel that things are out of control in their life the response is to be anxious, to experience anxiety. Now, and most people would admit that ultimately they are not in control of their lives. We can't make the next second happen, right? We could have a heart attack. We, we, we're really not in control of our lives. Uh, so, logically then, if we're not in control of our lives and being out of control is a source of anxiety, you would think logically that everybody would live in a constant state of anxiety, but that's not true. In fact, we say if people are living in a constant state of anxiety, there's a pathological problem there, right? So, so, uh, so why is it that we don't live in a constant state of anxiety? She would say what it points to is our, our person, our being, is responding to this reality as if someone is in control. And we know it's not us, but there is control in our lives. So there's no need to be anxious because this next second's gonna come. And if that control, and if that control isn't from us, as you know it isn't, then it must be from some reality outside of you. Right? So now you're now you're just using logic, you're coming to the point that there is a reality live your life outside yourself. We've said nothing about God so far. Now we would say that reality is God. But that's the kind of thinking that brought her to be open to the reality of God. Okay. Um, 
So, but either side at this point, again, is still an atheist when she embraces this philosophy. And I think it was this third element, the element of bracketing your preconceptions, that really <coughs> disposed her and opened her up because one of her preconceived notions was that God did not exist. And using this philosophy, she had to set aside that. And what helped her then come to the reality of God is that in her philosophical studies, a lot of her colleagues and friends were strong Christians. And she had to consciously be open to their experience. <coughs> and she was. And that they played a major role in her conversion. So at this point, she's still, but she's still six years away from entering the Catholic Church, but the process of conversion has begun. Okay, that's the end of my primer on phenomenology. We're going to go back to her life now. So uh, when when Edith first arrived at the University of Gottingham, there we go, uh, to study phenomenology in 1913, one of the first things that she did was to join the Philosophical Society, an informal group the philosophers led by um, Adolf Reinach, and he plays a role, he, play, he and his wife played an important role in her life, Adolf Reinach, over here. <coughs> and his wife Anne became close friends with Edith Stein. <coughs> Another person who comes into play later in this talk is Hedwig Martis, a philosopher. Now, in 1914, World War I broke out, and Adolf volunteered for military service. German patriotism was running very high at the time. Uh, quick aside, a quick aside, uh, Edith, even at the time, succumbed to this national patriotism, and she served as a Red Cross nurse in the German military hospital. I guess they used to put on skits for recreation. Now, unfortunately, Adolf Reinach Adolf Reinach uh, was killed in the war in Belgium in 1917. After Adolf's death, Edith went to help Anne, his wife, with arranging Adolf's papers and to console her. At the time, again, Edith was still an atheist. The key point of that is with no belief in an afterlife. And she expected to find Anne, as she would say, crushed by her sufferings, but what she found instead she describes a young widow, young widow filled with hope that offered the other mourners consolation and peace because of her strong Christian faith. Edith saw in Anne, again quoting her own words, a model of courage and peace in the face of tragedy. And this experience had a great impact on Edith Stein. She later said of this encounter, it was my first encounter with the cross and the divine power that it bestows on those who carry it. For the first time, I was seeing with my own eyes the church, born from the Redeemer's suffering, triumphant were the sting of death. That was the moment my unbelief collapsed and Christ shone forth in the mystery of the cross. So to me, it's interesting. She had this experience but later in life, reflecting on it, she said, this, this had the impact. At the time, maybe it didn't strike her, but reflecting back, she said, this was a turning point for me. So you can see how the, this idea of empathy works here. Edith experienced the death of her friend, Adolf Reinach, and for Edith at the time, it was an experience of sadness and finality. There was no afterlife in her belief system. Then through empathy, she was able to share another person's experience, Anne's experience of her husband's death, which was an experience of resignation and hope. Again, this was a major turning point in Edith's spiritual life. And by 1920, her only decision was whether she would enter the Evangelical Lutheran Church or the Catholic Church. The incident, incident that finally brought her to make her decision occurred when she was 29. <coughs> She was staying with some friends, Hans and Hedwig, Hedwig Conrad Martis, 
That was the lady that was in the, uh, the group picture. And this is a picture of Hedwig in her garden. One summer evening, the Martises were out, and Edith was alone in their house. And she randomly, that's what I love, she randomly picks a book out of the bookshelf and begins to read it. And turns out it was the autobiography of St. Teresa of Avila. And she couldn't put it down, and she stayed up all night reading it. And when she finished, she is alleged to have said, this is true. This was the final nudge that brought her into the Catholic Church. And on January 1st, 1922, she was baptized and entered the Roman Catholic Church at the age of 30. This is the baptismal found in the Church of St. Martin, where Edith was baptized. Her friend, Hedrick Mart Martis, was Edith's sponsor. Edith wore Hedrick's wedding dress as her baptismal dress, and she chose Teresa Hedrick as her baptismal names. Now there was many other incidents on the lot on the on her on her conversion story, uh, but if you read anything about Edith Stein, these two are the ones that always come up. But again, there were many other incidences. During the years after her graduation, um, she tried to get a position as a university professor. In spite of her obvious qualifications, she was unsuccessful because she was a female. So at the time, at the time, females were not considered for, for professor positions, and she eventually took a position as an instructor at the Women's Teachers College in Speyer, Germany, and she held that position for eight years. This is a picture of Edith with some of her students in their, in their uniforms. During that time, she continued. She also continued to write and started giving public lectures. She was a popular speaker. She gave speaking to gave speaking tours in Germany, Austria, Switzerland, and she even lectured on the radio. I tried to find some of those. Of course, she spoke in German, so it wouldn't do me any good. Um, in 1932, she she secured a position as a lec as a lecturer at the German Institute for Scientific Pedagogy in, in Münster. And then Hitler came into power in January of 1933, the next year. And soon afterwards, he forbade all Jews the right to hold office, to teach, and publish their work. And Edith, even though she had converted, was considered Jewish. Because for the Nazis, Jewishness is a term by blood, not religion. As a result, all of her lectures at the Institute were canceled. And at this point, all her professional opportunities were essentially blocked. But Edith saw in this turn of events making a clear path for her to enter the Carmelite Monastery in Cologne, which she had actually wanted to do when she first converted. So she did enter the Carmelite Convent in Cologne, in Germany, on October 15, 1933, at the age of 42. She asked for was given a religious name, Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, as an acknowledgement of St. Teresa and St. John of the Cross on her spiritual life. Edith saw in her religious name, Teresa Benedicta, quote, of the Cross, as an acknowledgement of the influence, oh, I'm sorry, of, of the Cross as a sign that she was given, in her own words, a special vocation to live the mystery of the cross. Years later, in a letter to a friend, Edith Stein writes that by her religious name, I must tell you that I already brought my religious name with me into the house as a postulate. I received it exactly as I requested it. By the cross, I understood the destiny of God's people, which, even at the time, began to announce itself. I thought that those who recognize it as the cross of Christ, had to take it upon themselves in the name of all. Certainly today I know more of what it means to be wedded to the Lord in the sign of the cross. Of course, one can never comprehend it, for it is a mystery. There was, now, there was always concern that since the Nazis consider her a Jew, she and the other nuns might be in some sort of jeopardy from the Nazis. Eventually, she moved out of Germany to a convent in Holland in 1939. Uh, and this on the left 
is a photo required for her passport to travel to Holland. Her sister Rosa converted after the death of their mother and joined Edith in the convent in Holland as an extern sister. Now eventually, Germany invaded Holland and started to impose their regulations against the Jews in Holland. Then in 1942, in retaliation for the Catholic Church's public denunciation of the conduct of the Jews toward of the Nazis toward the Jews, the Nazis arrested all Christian Jews. And she, along with her sister Rosa, were transported to Auschwitz, where she, along with 300 other Catholics of Jewish descent, was sent to the gas chamber. She died at age 50. She was arrested on August 2nd, and seven days later, on August 9th, died in the gas chamber at Auschwitz. Now there's something very prophetic about Edith Stein's passport photo. It was taken at the threshold of the open door of the enclosure at Cologne, and on the wall above Edith, you can faintly see the cross over her head. Very faint. Anybody see it? Here's a copy of her death certificate. Birthday, October 12, 1891, Jewish Day of Atonement. Baptismal name, Edith Theresa Hedwig Stein. Arrested August 2, 1942. Died August 9, 1942, Auschwitz. 45 years after her death, she was beatified and in 1998 canonized by St. Pope John Paul II. Now, in the Catholic Church, there are two paths to sainthood, either through heroic virtue, in that case, two miracles are needed, or through martyrdom for the faith, in that case, one miracle is needed. The original cause for her canonization was following the path of demonstrating Edith Stein's life of heroic virtue. During the process, it was proposed that because of the circumstances of her death at Auschwitz, she, would, she also would be considered a martyr. This was accepted by the church, and when she was beatified in 1987, she was declared a martyr of the church and possessor of heroic virtues. Now, it's true that Edith Stein wasn't a martyr in the classic sense of the term, like she didn't die in the lion's den or in front of a firing squad, she died, most likely, with other Jewish Catholics, <coughs> and she was chosen for arrest, in large part, because she was Jewish. But the reason her death is recognized as martyrdom is not based just on her death at Auschwitz, but also because of the circumstances surrounding her death. That she was arrested along with other Jewish converts in direct response to the Catholic Church's public denunciation of the Nazis' treatment of the Jews. <coughs> and for her clear, her clear intent to offer her life for others. Three years before her death, in her letter to a prioress on Passion Sunday, 1939, she wrote, please allow me to offer myself to the heart of Jesus as a sacrifice and propitiation for true peace, that the dominion of the Antichrist may collapse, if possible, without a new world war and that a new order may be established. I would like it, my request, granted this very day because it is the twelfth hour. I know that I am nothing, but Jesus desires it. Later that year, she writes in her last will and testimony, I joyfully accept in advance the death God has appointed for me in perfect submission to his holy will. And she goes on to specifically offer her life for the church, the Carmelite order, the Jewish people, the German people, and her family. And as she was being arrested, she is alleged to have said to her sister Rosa, come, let us go for our people. A willing victim offering herself for her people, in a sense fulfilling the prophecy of her birth on the day of Jewish atonement. Now being recognized as a martyr meant she only needed one miracle for her canonization. 
And that miracle occurred the same year as Edith Stein's beatification in 1987. A two-year-old girl had taken a lethal overdose of Tylenol and her liver and kidneys were failing. Her only chance was a liver transplant and even that seemed hopeless. Now some interesting things about this child. Her name was Teresa Benedicta. She had been named in Edith Stein's honor. She was a child of Mary and Reverend Emmanuel Charles McCarthy, a Catholic priest of the Eastern Rite, so a married priest. The family laid hands on the area of the little girl's liver and prayed for Edith Stein's intercession on Sunday. By the end of the week, she had, she had completely recovered with no need for a transplant. 11 years later, in 1998, this girl was present at the canonization of Edith Stein in Rome. A year after Edith's canonization, on October 1st, 1999, Edith Stein was declared co-patroness of Europe along with St. Bridget and St. Catherine of Siena. And some speculate that one day she may be declared a doctor of the church along with three other famous Carmelite doctors of the church, St. Teresa of Avila, St. Teresa of Lisieux, and St. John of the Cross. Now, just finish up with a few words on Edith Stein's spirituality. Uh, spiritual writers can use a lot of words to talk about the spiritual life. St. John of the Cross is an example. Uh, but at its core, it's really very simple. You think of St. Teresa of Lazor's simple way as a great example. One, in one of her letters, Edith is responding to a criticism that her lectures are too spiritual. Edith replies, it appears that you do not want me to want the supernatural to be brought up at all. But if I could not speak about that, I would probably not mount the lecture's platform at all. Besides, it is always the small, simple truth that I have to express, how to go about living at the Lord's hand. And what does it mean to live at the Lord's hand? In Edith's words, accepting the daily events of life is coming from the hand of God, she writes. From God's point of view, nothing is accidental. My entire life, even in the most minute details, was pre-designed in the plans of divine providence, and is thus for all, and is thus for the all-seeing eye of God a perfect coherence of me. God has a big picture and we'll place all the pieces of our life together for our good. And then, accepting everything from God and conversely placing all the events of our daily life into God's hands, she writes, and when night comes and retrospect shows that everything was patchwork and much which one had planned is now left undone, when so many things rouse shame and regret, then take it all as it is, lay it in God's hands and offer it up to Him in this way, we will, we will be able to rest in him and begin the new day like a new life. And maybe in a very simplistic way, it means with the trusting attitude of the child laying one's whole life in the hands of God. And somehow it seems appropriate that Einstein, who for the most of her life was known as a philosopher and an intellectual, would come to embrace the simple simplicity of placing her whole life in the loving hands of God with the attitude of a trusting child. And that her first work, her first work as a saint, her first miracle, would be to rescue an innocent two-year-old from the brink of death and return her to, to, return her to the loving arms of her family. And with that, Thank you very much.